Pauly Shore. <laughs> Pauly, it's, it's great to have you here, man. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank you for having me. You know, I was thinking of all the people, all the comics who have come in here. I think your career is probably the most unique uh, mm. from having this second generation comic and the environment that you grew up in as a kid. It's just really different. Yeah, it's uh, the, it's interesting because when I go on stage, when I tour, I I, I tour a lot. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> uh, no, I tour a lot. Like in small town America, mm -hmm. I like those audiences. I like, you know, I was just in Knoxville, Tennessee. And it's interesting because a lot of the people that come to see me, they just know me from like son-in-law right? or they'll know me from Biodome and stuff like that, but they don't know like where I came from. Yeah. And then they're like, what, you actually have a family? <laughs> <laughs> like you actually have a mom and a dad? Like weren't you just hatched from like a marijuana bush or something? <laughs> and I'm like, no, I actually have a mom and a dad and I'm from a place and, and, and yeah, growing up, being born and raised in Hollywood. Yeah. Um, which is a, a weird thing to begin with because most people that are in the entertainment business are not from Hollywood. Most people, I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of them come from small towns in America or all over the world and they move out there. I, I'm actually one of the only people that was like born on the Sunset Strip that was born out there. And um, so I've been there, you know, I've been there my whole life. And, Even um, saying born on there. the Sunset Strip, it almost seems like the start of a joke there. I mean, it just doesn't seem like a place. Yeah, I should be dead right now. <laughs> yeah, right. I should be sharing a shed with Andy Dick. <laughs> <laughs> it does, yeah, put that gum anywhere. Um, but I feel it, like I'm in high school again. <laughs> I'm doing, um, but no, it does it's, almost, it's, it's, yeah. it's interesting because... People always say like, well, was it weird having Richard Pryor and say, you know, like all these things that were not weird to me at all at mm. the time. But when I'm sitting here with you guys and people are like, like your dad opened for Elvis Presley <laughs> or, or, you know, or, you know, or, you know, your mom, you know, told Gary Shandling he wasn't ready or, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. <laughs> Then you look and it's like it's like unique and it's like yeah. different and it's special. But it's funny because people are always like, "Well, why don't you do a book?" You know what I mean? Do a book, and I'm like, "I want to do a book," but they say that the people that like me don't know how to read. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what I mean? like seriously, isn't that sad? <laughs> like that was like the, that was the feedback from all the publishers. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, well, we love his story and he's great, blah, blah, blah. but the people that like him don't know how to read. I'm like, you're fucking idiots. <laughs> you know what I mean? So this isn't just an, uh, an opinion. They actually did a marketing study, and your fans and don't, don't read. To read. Yeah, um, maybe I could do it in Braille or something, <laughs> or like a pop-up book. Maybe I could do a pop-up pop book. Well, that might, might be fun. Maybe a video game where you're just yeah. sitting there and it's Paulie's yeah, life. Yeah, it's like, yeah. Well, for the folks that don't know, uh, like you said, his father was uh, uh, working the big rooms in Vegas many, yeah. many years ago, and his mother uh, Mitzi is kind of the reason there even are comedy clubs. I mean, she was there yeah. at the beginning, opening up the comedy store, and because of that. Every well, it funny was a person. Comedy boom. It was like if you think yeah. back in the seventies, the early eighties, that's when kind of like Johnny Carson was there. And if you if anyone remembers Johnny Carson, he was the guy, you know, way before Letterman and Leno that would do this sh the the talk show and the comics that he would bring on, they would do these like little ten minute or five minute spots, you know, if they did well, like boom, star. Like you were literally like NBC, Overnight, yeah. ABC, they, that's what they did with Freddie Prince and, mm -hmm. and Jimmy Walker and all those guys. But nowadays, if you see a comic on Letterman or Leno and you're like, oh, he's pretty good, they're not going to be developing shows yeah. off of those people. So the time was a really special time. And, and Freddie Prince was one of the first, I think, that did that. And they all started with my mom. Yeah. You know, at the uh, comedy store. Uh, right? David Brenner actually told this story on this show where, like, the night after he did the. Carson show, you know, he just yeah, had tons on. of bookings yeah. and, and he was huge. And now, you know, guys that get HBO specials and they're just back to work in the same rooms they were the night yeah, before. It's, it's really weird. tough now. Yeah, it's weird, you know, because like you'll do a big special for Showtime or whatever and then you go out on the road and it's still the same. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. But now what's really interesting is you got things like Sirius and you got things that 
are viral. Like I have this movie adopted that's mm. coming out and it's just, it's kind of an interesting time because people are going to try to really kind of, I think move towards the internet into this kind of format, which is a new time. And we're at a, we're kind of, we're, we're at this kind of, the industry is at this kind of transformational period. Like we're at the beginning, I think of a new time, mm -hmm. you know, everyone is like saying, well, the, the internet fucked up, <laughs> you know, the music industry and mm -hmm. it fucked up, Well, you got to go where the cheese is. Like if that's where the world and the business is going, then you got to go where that is and try and figure it out. And everyone's trying to figure it out. So you, uh, I mean, that's one of the things that works for you because you're not, you could be spending all your time going, well, wait, I already achieved the things that you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I made it to TV, I made it to movies, but all that stuff can get flushed away pretty quickly. It's not, you redo. yeah, the thing is about the business, people always say like, oh, I want to get in the business, I want to do this and do that. <laughs> it's really a lifestyle, you know what I mean? It's really, you don't want to do any of this for the money or the fame. You want to do it because you love to do it. Like adopt it, it's not like I got paid Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I didn't get paid. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. someone else financed it, but I didn't. They didn't pay me to do it. You know what I mean? I worked on it for like two years, like right. I mean, uh, editing it and doing all this stuff. It's like I I did it because I love to do it. Mm -hmm. And if you come from that place, then you'll succeed because you can't think about like, oh, I'm gonna. Ha I have to have a hit. You can't right. go into it that way. You got to always just be into the work and into the process of doing the stuff and then if your stuff lands it lands and if it doesn't it doesn't you just keep going well you know, you know we talked about the way that you grew up and seeing so many <clears throat> great comics some guys really make it some of the people who worked for your mom went on to become gigantic stars other people could be hysterical the funniest people you'll ever see in your life but it doesn't work out for them. A lot of that has to do with attitude too, right? Of course. Yeah. A lot of it has to do. With, I always had this kind of stupid saying, um, but it's, I, I think it's cool. It's like you almost have to have, in order to make it, I think you have to have all the ingredients to the cookie. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Like mm -hmm. if you have a cookie, you can't just have like brown sugar and, you know, some, some nuts and so you got to have like everything in order to make it. You got to be business. You got, I mean, it's a lot of stuff you have to you know, you have to, you know, do it. It's like, for me, it's like when I was younger, when I would do these different roles and different things, I didn't go into stuff going, oh, like this is going to be, you know, a hit or it's not going to be a hit because a lot of stuff I did didn't work out. You know what I mean? Because I wasn't thinking. I wasn't, you know what I mean? I wasn't having the business right. guy. I was the guy that was just wanting to work. But it's tough to it's, turn down things when, you know, yeah, at you know point. what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You know, like when they offered me, like when I did, um, I guess it was Jury Duty was the first movie that I did, which was the beginning of the end. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. But you know, you look but you look back on it now and you're like, Oh, that was a funny movie. Right. Yeah, well fuck you. Where were you when it came out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well You it, know what I mean? But because it was cool to hate me back then. Right. Do you know what I mean? It was cool to but now Polly Shore is like old and he's like cool again. Like, <laughs> oh, we like him again. It's like it's fuck it's like a mind fuck. <laughs> But you see, know what I mean? So, is, it is funny. If you didn't watch those movies in order, Joy Duty could have easily been the second or third movie, and it, it would have went yeah, over yeah, fine. Yeah, the time frame. It was like, yeah. you know, I had my run, you know, but then like, you know, like anyone's run that makes it really big, really fast, eventually they start to slow down. Mm -hmm. And it's the time, you know, when you slow down, that's when, you know, when the phone's not ringing and you don't have any representation, that's when, you know, you do things like Andy Dick's doing right now or... You know, or some of my other co-stars that I've worked with, I just hear horror stories about like what what, what are they doing, like what right. happened and and stuff like that. But it's a tough business. It's a tough business. Well, the great know? thing about being a stand-up is you're not just sitting there waiting on movie roles. Right. You can go out, you can create, you can be part of things. It's about it's about doing. You know, it's not about what level it is. Right. It's not about like oh shit, I got to do a feature feature film and it's got to be in fifty thousand screens. You're like, no, I could do a little web video. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I could do something really, you know, and learn and just, it's just about doing. And that's, and that's, there's a lot of people that write scripts, you know what I mean? But to actually make the film and actually go through the whole process, that's the hardest part. You know what I mean? You know, to do an independent film and try to figure it out, you know? Well, let's go back uh, when you were just growing up and you're seeing comedy. And again, I understand it's like being born into a circus family, it's going to kind of seem 
normal to any kid. Very normal. Yeah. But at a certain point, you had to look up on that stage and see some of these people and think, oh, that's, there's a lot of power there. Everybody's looking at them. And that had to be you know, somewhat alluring, I guess, for a kid, right? I guess. I mean, I have brothers and sisters and they didn't feel that. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like you're either born into born a stand up or you're not. It's not like you know what I mean? It's not like you know, like for instance, I was talking about touring and doing shows on the road. It's not like, oh, I can't wait to hop on a fucking plane and go to Jitsville, <laughs> <Right. laughs> you know, yeah. America. It's like that's not the motivation. The motivation is, you know, I'm gonna get on that mic. It's almost like a sickness. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it was in my system. So the thing that, that turned me on as far as watching comics, I just watched the guys. People are like, well, what kind of comedy do you like? Like, like for me, I like the guys that are that are really edgy but very lovable. Mm -hmm. You know, like I thought Richard Pryor and Sam Kennison, and I always bring them up as the, my two favorite guys because they're, they were something so lovable mm -hmm. and likable about both those guys. But yet, you know, Sam Kennison would scream or Richard Pryor would – go off on some you yeah. know crazy you know bit about freebasing you know what i mean or, <laughs> or being raised at a whorehouse or whatever mm -hmm. but there was something really lovable about him and that's i think the most important part about stand-up comedy is to engage your audience and and i think a lot of people don't have that you know you look at guys like dane cook you know what i mean mm -hmm. funny guy huge selling stadiums but i don't feel the i'm not i don't feel the connection you know what i mean i don't feel like i want to hug him no does that make sense mm. I well, mean, that funny guy, you know, most popular out there, but I don't feel like, you know, there's no, I don't feel like that, you know, that heart, you know what I mean? Well, that's the weird thing for you, I think, Should you I know, this gum. Sorry. Yeah, no, you put it uh, wherever you want. Sorry. Somebody <laughs> might even want to finish that no, after no, you're no, done. No. So is here. Uh, but for you, you did have that thing where people liked you a lot. I remember even hearing from comics that when you would be a little kid, you were like out front of the comedy store like break dancing and just yeah. hanging out there and you had a skateboard and shit and they, like uh, it just always seemed like that thing of something's going on let me come around but i remember uh uh one of sam's friends mitchell walters was party package package party, party. <laughs> you know this it's fucking guy <laughs> holy yeah. Yeah. shit one of the funniest guys this yeah. guy's going what the fuck are they talking yeah. about no but this guy was fucking insane yeah. well we're not here to rat out anybody on their uh, usages of anything either <laughs> party package could be anything but um but he I got a great story about Mitchell oh, yeah <laughs> okay well, I'll tell you right after you go on no we, we no he what I'm sorry the, the, well, one of the things that he brought up, like, and he, he told me about it as soon as you were popping, is that when you were a little kid, mm. all the comics were crazy about you. Mm. That all the comics, like that likability thing mm. that you were talking about, you had already had even as a little kid. Yeah, I had, and, and that, that, that was the, my first, that was like my first kind of connection with, I think the audience was my connection that I had with the MTV camera, mm -hmm. you know, which was, Hey, but you know what I mean? Right. Like <laughs> straight to the camera, you know what I mean? And yeah. it was like, it was like that thing that I had where like, if we were going into someone's house, I'd be like, yo bro, check this out. You know what yeah. I mean? And I would bring the camera in the house and I'd start like, it was just this connection that I had with people. And that's why to this day, everywhere I go, people, you know, hug me or high five me or they <laughs> smile or there's, you know, some type of, you know, some type of uh, um, joy, you know, that, that, that I made them feel. And that, I, I guess, I guess it's from, you know, watching Sam and Richard and, mm -hmm. and those guys, you know. Well, you know, you brought up when you first started doing MTV and you were doing a style that was your own. And I guess it was based somewhat on yourself and the kids that you grew up with. I mean. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't a character. People mm -hmm. always say like, well. Was a weasel a character? Like, no, that's who I was. Right. You know what I mean? And I'm just a crustier version of the weasel right now. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. It's like, right? <laughs> because I wasn't like, I was never like Pee Wee Herman where, <laughs> like, where he put on, you know, Paul Rubens, like he put on an outfit and he turned into this crazy thing. I was, I did dress like in pink bandanas and shorts and, you know, a purple <laughs> Jeep and I'd give people my headshots <laughs> running down Sunset Boulevard <laughs> and I was so excited. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was uh, so excited about just getting in the business. I didn't know how I was going to make it. Mm. I didn't know what I was going to do and I just, you know, so it was like, you know, uh, I mean, the, my, my wardrobe 
it came from it came from uh, Steven Tyler, mm -hmm. and then also my mom's closet. Right. But I but I really went in my mom's closet because she'd have shirts that were torn like that and kind of like <laughs> hanging over That's and right. with holes and you know what I mean. And yeah. then I put on the the scarves and yeah. you know what I mean. Like, hey, hey, bro, <laughs> you know, you well, know? and it, it turned into this whole kind yeah. of like. You know, it's like this this cabbage patched on acid thing. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, you really did kind of look somewhat like the kids that were on their way to a Guns N' Roses yeah. show because you basically were. I were, yeah. And yeah, and but why, when you saw the camera, why did you risk not? You know, why did you go off in this way of your own? I mean, you're not supposed to grab the camera. You're not supposed to start hugging it, was it an and accident. talking. It wasn't yeah. planned. It wasn't like. I go, oh, I'm going to do this. It was just spontaneous. It was mm -hmm. almost like, it was funny because my first week ever on MTV, it was totally poly. And my first week ever was like, it was called Sunset Strip Week. Mm -hmm. So it was me just kind of walking down Sunset Strip, fucking with people. And I would always say, hey, you know, every, like, after a couple minutes, the producer would be like, yo, yo, yo. And that, which meant I had to like cut to the video, like say, you know, there's a video. Mm -hmm. And the good part about me as a VJ I didn't ever have to say what video it was. That's too much information. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was like all I had to say was check out a video. That was it. And even that was tough for me. You know what I mean? Because I'd be rolling around. Check out a video. And it was like, it was like, uh, you know, it was, uh, it was uh, like that. And then, and then as far as, uh, you know, as far as Sunset Strip Week, I bumped into like Millie Vanilli and, and, and Sam Kennis was there, and I was just kind of going to tattoo shops, and I did the whole thing. And I remember looking at the producer of the show, this guy named Paul Cockrell, and this other guy, Su this other girl, Suzanne, and they were horrified because their job was on the line. Mm -hmm. I mean, they got paid to film with this crazy guy on Sunset Strip, you know, to host this thing, you know. And I remember specifically going into my mom's, we were at my mom's house, I still live in my mom's house, and taking the tape from my first appearance on MTV and sticking in the VHS and they're like, you know, it's like drum roll type <laughs> shit and we were fucking dying. <laughs> we're like, this is fucking funny. Like I was dying like because because it was just, I didn't know what I was doing. You know what I mean? And it was just something real about it and the, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Real about it. And that's why I like working with kids because kids, you just don't know what's going to happen. Right. And I was like a big kid and, and it just worked. For some reason, it just worked. And then it just kind of took off and snowballed. And then, you know, the rest is history. On that. And, you know, when we got back to talking about, uh, you know, The Tonight Show at one time, when you were coming up, MTV was like, you know, had 60% of kids watching it at any given moment. I mean, the second you went on with there, you're just this major star yeah, to was, that bracket. Yeah, know, it was, I was on every day from three to four in the afternoon, mm -hmm. and it was a, a show called Totally Paul, and it was on it before Yo MTV Raps. And now, if you watch MTV, it's all Yo MTV Raps, and it's like one rock, you mm -hmm. know, section. Right. But um, yeah, it was uh, it was uh, that that was that was my show. What, what year was that? That, you that was the early nineties, like ninety one, ninety two. Yeah, yeah. So you had that, and you know the everything that you were doing then became massive in terms of like the spring break things. Just tons of people were showing up. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I remember my, my first spring break though, it was terrible, it mm -hmm. backfired. You know what I mean? It was like, yeah, yeah it was bad because I remember um, they brought me down there and it was, I remember back in the 90s like in the 80s, like MTV was live right. and it was a big event. It wasn't like they pre-taped three or four shows and played a couple of them and that was it. It was like, it was a it was a big event and it was it was they spent a lot of money on it and it was live and I remember the first time ever I was doing like a top twenty video countdown and it was with downtown Julie Brown and she says to me she goes uh, you know we got Polly Shore here what do you, what's the difference between the spring breaks in California the spring breaks in <laughs> in uh, in Florida and I look in the camera and I'm like everyone's wasted <laughs> and no one laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> No one laughed, and they're like, "All right." When they go to this video, and then she goes to the video, she gives information, and they literally sent me home. Really? Yeah, like the next day, they're like, well, "What's this guy doing? We can't have him on the air. He's unpredictable, and and stuff like that." And then you know, and everyone was wasted though. It yeah, was, everyone was wasted. Yeah, yeah, but you're not supposed to say so on TV. Yeah. So when that thing started to pop, you hadn't really had your stand up going yet, right? Or no, I was doing my stand. up You were doing yet. your stand up. Yeah. I started my stand up at 17. Right. And I hit on MTV when I was like. 21, 22, 23, around there. All right, so you've had a couple years in, but not nearly enough, I would guess, 
to have the material to support no, the shit no, that you're uh -uh, doing. Uh -uh. Yeah. So that that becomes kind of quick stress, right? I mean, it's one thing to have the people show up and want to see, you know, Paulie from MTV, but then well, that's why my punchlines would be a stage dive. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, right. That's no, like seriously, like that that was my my thing. Right. It's like it was like I was the only comic like people would come to shows and they wouldn't sit. <laughs> it was everyone was standing, you know right. what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, that type of shit. Right. There was no material. <laughs> you know, there was no material. Yeah. And then I thought I was a singer for a while. <laughs> you know, I did my song Lisa Lisa. Right. You know, and um so yeah, it was all persona. It was all my persona. Uh, but at the time, did you say, how can I keep this thing going? Or were you still like, no, who gives a shit? A yeah, just was, having a Willy Wonka in the chocolate house. I got yeah. the golden ticket. <laughs> well, I, it was a factory, but still. <laughs> but so you're at that point. Now, you know what it also reminded me of? Like the, you were like that, that guy that the girls all liked. So I imagine there would be a certain amount of boyfriends that weren't so crazy about it when was, Polly come into town. No, it was interesting because... I'm sure there were, but I got mm. I got a lot of guys that liked me. Right. You know, a lot of guys were like, weasel, ah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And then the girl would be like, shut up, you're retarded. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or whatever. And I'd be like, yeah. whoa, 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 you know what I mean? But uh, no, it was it was kind of mixed. It was kind of mixed in a way. You so uh, it's good times. And then you get the call from, I guess, Disney about movies. is, Or was that your idea? Did you pitch them or did they No, call what you? happened was is... Um, is you know my show was really hot on MTV and um, I was doing all the specials for MTV and then what happened is I think there's a guy named Peter Paterno who was the uh, he was the head of Hollywood Records which was at Disney and he brought in a tape that I did to Jeffrey Katzenberg mm -hmm. and Jeffrey Katzenberg at the time was the head of Disney and now he, you know he works at DreamWorks and what happened was is they were doing a film called Encino Man right and it was already written. And the, but the way that it was written, it was written for two guys that find the caveman, but the two guys that it was written for were exactly alike, two nerds. Mm -hmm. So Jeffrey says, well, fuck this. Like, let's, let's you know, put Polly in there as one of the guys and rewrite, you know, the best friend role. You know what I mean? The right. best friend role. So that's what we did. We so just wrote, wrote the best friend role in that film um, and then made it like, you know, Sean Astin's character was kind of nerdy, and I was like, "Bro, you know right. what I mean?" And then we did that, and you know, we did we made the caveman. You know, we kind of tug and pull on the caveman. So, and then Brandon, great actor, mm. so he brought like a very great realism to the role, which brought my comedy out even more. Because if anyone knows anything about comedy, the best thing, the best person to work with are are really good actors. Mm. You know, and that's what was great about in Son in Law when I worked with uh, 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 shit, uh, Lane Smith. Yeah. You know, who is the, fa the father and son-in-law, such a good actor, you know, like getting off the truck and going, you know, middle America. And he's just <laughs> looking at me like he wants to fucking kill me. You know what I mean? Like it was the best. You know what I mean? Like y your comedy becomes better when you work with really good actors. So for a first movie, you're a kid. It's a pretty big studio picture, everything that goes along with it. Were you feeling pressure then or were you just no, still, bro, ri it's all happening. still it's just riding the wave? <laughs> No, I didn't. I wasn't thinking about it. I wasn't in the business. Thing. Yeah. It was more like, I didn't know. Yeah. You know what I mean? I didn't know. I just wanted to, you know, do this thing. You know what I mean? You know, it's really interesting. It was, it's still playing. All these films are still playing. Uh, um, matter of fact, Encino Man was on last night. Mm. And uh, to see that stuff hold up, it also gives you a chance to, it's cool that it's still there, but I guess you also can't take that step back. It's always going to be. That persona of you no, as a kid love, is going to be no, there. It's a great, but it's a, I'm not that guy anymore. It's just mm -hmm. you know, I look back on that and I'm like, you know what I mean? I'm not that guy. I mean, um, but the film is the film holds up as a film, right? So forget me. I mean, I'm off doing whatever I'm doing now. But this is a this is a piece that's le that I left over it's called a diarrhea. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, this is a piece that I left behind because that. Um, <laughs> 
that that still 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 holds up you know what i mean and mm. parents can show it to their kids and their kids are going to show it to their kids and it's just one of those films that's still fun and it still works and it still gets big ratings and that's why it continues to play on tv so the next one you did af after that hit right did that when, when the movie comes out and it hits and now you're who uh, an encino man one? Enc yeah an encino yeah. man and it hits and I would imagine you got a huge amount of the credit for it, even though... Uh, yeah, I got a lot of credit. It was weird, though, because it came at a time where I was just starting to fucking rock, da 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 yeah. and then fucking Sam Kennison died. Right. So it was like, holy shit, like, you know, talk about, you know, this was my comedy mentor. This is the guy that took me under his wing. This was the guy that, you know, I worshipped, you know? He was like, I don't want to call my real dad, but he was a guy that I, you know, I, I, I followed. He was the guy. And then he died. And it was like a really kind of depressing time for me as well. So and that's was, that was really hard. The me. exact time. And this is, was this the first time you ever had something like that happen in your life? Uh, had you ever dealt with losing someone? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. When I was younger, I had my best friend Brent died in a, a Jeep accident. Yeah. yeah, that was tough. So there's no kind of way. I mean, if the only thing to be able to deal with something when you care about somebody like that is a certain amount of time. No amount of, you know, dealing besides I still have to deal with it. I mean, yeah. it's still, it's one of those things like, you know, I mean, it's like, it would almost be like if, you know, I don't want to say this, but it would almost be like if Michael Jordan died, what would Kobe think? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, you know, that was his guy that he kind of emulated. You know what I mean? So, um it was kind of that like Kobe would still be Kobe but he had like something missing you know what I mean? right so it was always like my heart was always kind of man I was been like kind of you know so to be able to, to jump back in and make people laugh maybe your head wasn't there at the time probably or maybe, not yeah yeah uh is that only something that you can look back on now I mean is should it made it maybe have been a thing where you took some time off or I was on a roll you know mm -hmm. what I mean it's like you know it's like uh you know Dane I would talk about Dane Cook you know Dane Cook you know, I think at the peak of his thing a couple of years ago, his mom passed away, you know, so that was probably a really hard time for him, but he kept working. Like his mom would probably want him to keep working. So like Sam, you know, I think would, would, would want me to, you know, just continue. You know what I mean? Right. And then even the interesting thing, I mean, we talk about your dad being a big comic, your mom running the comedy store, but none of them, uh, and even Sam, for that matter, did not have the movie mm. success that you had so quick. I mean, mm -hmm. there was there's not a lot of people who could look over and go, "Oh, I know what it's like to have four mm -hmm. back to back hit movies." I mean, it's it's a pretty unique thing. Yeah, no, I was lucky. Yeah, you know, I was lucky that people that I you know came at a time where people wanted to see me. So, mm. yeah. uh, so you just kept going, even though you felt awful about Sam. You just kept going. Yeah, I kept going. Yeah. What was the next big film for you after that? Uh, son in law. <laughs> son in law. Son in law, yeah. yeah. And what, at this point, did they start to pitch you as that kind of weasel character where they come into you saying, here's a place to, to put the character? No, or it was, it was already it written. Was written for, we, would write, we would now, at this point, we were writing movies for me. Yeah. So they were basically like Jeffrey Katzenberg would say, this is the movie. You mm -hmm. know, now I'll write it for him. Right. And I would work with the writers and we would do it together. And the point was always fish out of water. This fish guy's out of water, not yeah. supposed to be here. Yeah. But a guy, the thing is that Jeffrey Katzenberg always said, which, which stuck with me, which I thought was cool, was, was that, you know, the world, you know, sees things this way. Mm -hmm. Polly sees things this way. Right. So that, that's kind of, you know, and then this way actually at the end of the day kind of makes sense. You know, almost like, um, you know, uh, uh, in Son in Law, like, the parents like you know you, I'm the weird guy coming in but at the end of the day I'm the one that brought the, everyone together right so I thought that was kind of cool and there's always that thing that he liked everybody he you know you uh, your characters were never out to do actual harm you no. got in trouble and stuff mm -hmm. but you know you even liked the people who didn't like you so much yeah I would yeah. try and hug people yeah, 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 yeah. just like real life <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah 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 exactly oh by the way in, in your uh, new film uh, Adopt It when you're hugging that African child and then uh, scrubbing him in the bathtub, um, <laughs> it was an uncomfortable moment for me. It was just... <laughs> well, you obviously don't like little chubby black kids. <laughs> I do, but only to a I point. I love little chubby <laughs> yeah. black kids. Yeah. I love little chubby kids, period. I would actually do like to do a show which is called Polly and Chubby Kids. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, 
let's go back over to why this thing is uh, is going on. The success is just one after another, right? Just yeah. everything that's happened is a success. And then you said you got to a certain point where it just all started to fade. Well, the next one was in the army now. Right. Right. I did that. And that was, again, written for me. And that was... Um, so much fun, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? It was great to do. It was uh, great working with Andy Dick because it was the first time that you, you know, that that I think into this day almost like where you see Andy like just at that point where he's still innocent and he's still like, you know, like, you know, it's before he lost his mind. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> because he is such a brilliant comedic mm -hmm. actor, and but you know, but now unfortunately, like his lifestyle or all his stuff that you hear about is overpowered. It's almost like Tom Cruise. It's like every time you see Tom Cruise, he's a great actor, but, you know, he jumped on Oprah's couch. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a little, he's a little weird. You know what I mean? Right? I mean, it's like, like, like he's in this new, like, film with, like, uh, um, uh, with, uh, what's her name? Um, Cameron Diaz. Yeah, Cameron Diaz, and it's like you're looking at him, going, "Yeah, this is good, but you're that weird guy." <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean, right? You know, and, but that's you know, but so while we're, to, while we're taking shots at Tom Cruise, I'm just going to point out again: I saw you scrubbing a chubby African baby <laughs> in a bathtub. <laughs> you, you, by the way, you do have to see this film; it's really. Uh, yeah. It's so it's the new film you're doing. It's like a mockumentary thing, mm -hmm. um, and at certain points of it, I would forget that and think it was a documentary, and actually think I think he just screwed that kid up for life. Right, right, right. <laughs> well, that was the point. <laughs> well, no, the point the point was is like I said, like once you've done your own film and you've actually like accomplished it, then you start having a you you always have a vision for your film, but until you actually do it. Then you can have a vision for your next film and your next film. Your vision gets more focused every time you do it because you've, you've learned more. You've learned pacing. You've learned this. So when I came up with the vision for this film, it was important that I, that I nailed exactly what you said, which is what's real, what's not. Mm -hmm. you know, keep this very unproduced and keep it very raw. I didn't have 50 people running around. There wasn't like... Even though it was a real film, like it was casted and all that stuff, there wasn't like craft service and honey wagons. And it was like I was going to the neighborhoods with cameras and they didn't know, they didn't know who I was. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to do. But then there's also a storyline in the film with the beginning, middle and end because at the end of the day, you don't want a film where I'm just walking around going, where do I get an African child? Right. Because it gets old after a while, you know. Well, it's also interesting too that there are parts – of Africa that look exactly like East St. Louis. That's my I mean, point. It's but that's crazy. why I wanted to show that. <laughs> yeah. Because if you think, if we all think of Africa, <laughs> right. you think of the, 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 you know, dropping the bales of wheat and <laughs> everyone's dying and look at the poverty, which is yeah. true. It's all there. But there's also this other side of Africa that's beautiful that the people don't want you to take their kids. They want, like, if you want to help us out, like, buy us a beer or something. <laughs> yeah, right. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you, the people that you were walking up to and said, I'm here to buy a kid, that was... That was more documentary. That right, was more of a, right. like a or the Oprah Winfrey school when I go yeah, to the Oprah Winfrey yeah, school. Yeah, yeah, that was uncomfortable. <laughs> 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 the Oprah Winfrey school people were really freaked out by yeah, it. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's you, know, it's a, you know, when you do stuff like this and you get people's reaction, you know that they really don't know what the fuck is going on. You get gold inside, you start tingling, you know what I mean? You, so you're feeling it oh right my there. God, you're like, yeah, this is I can't wait stuff. to get this out. If, oh, I, yeah. if I get back alive, this right, is going to exactly. be really good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there are it's parts. It's almost yeah. like going into a foreign land and yeah. like taking a jewel and coming home with <laughs> yeah. it and not getting killed, you know what I mean? <laughs> that, there are scenes here that it just looks like like maybe that funny guy from school got off the wrong off ramp all of a sudden and this shit isn't going to fly here. Yeah, well, those are real. But those up. are real. Those are real townships and those are real yeah. places that I went that are dangerous because the cameraman was like, we can't go in there. <laughs> you know, like we're going to get killed. I'm like, you can't stop filming. Please don't right. stop filming. You know what I mean? Like we got to get this stuff. And and it was it was you know it was crazy. You know what else was kind of amusing is like in the middle of it you stop and do stand up, and I'm like, uh, Paulie Shore is really big in South Africa. You had a mm -hmm. really nice yeah. crowd there. Well, that was the whole reason why I went there to begin with. <laughs> yeah, I didn't go there. That's the thing is like I didn't go to Africa 
to adopt a child. I went there to do a gig. Right. <laughs> now, you know I mean? yeah, sure, now I get it. Yeah, no, I went there to do a gig, but me, it's like, I always like to take advantage of situations and opportunities that come across my desk, mm. <laughs> that come across my yeah. life. I say, right. you know, if I'm going to fucking Africa, I'm not gonna just do stand up, that's retarded. <laughs> I'm gonna like film a film. <laughs> so I went down there and that's when I started going like this and I started working with the producer. Together we came up with the, the concept and then he left me alone in my hotel room and I storyboarded the whole thing with cards and day one, day two, day three, got a casting agent, we casted all the kids. We hired a production. We hired uh, some cameras, some shooters, and we went out there and just, you know, location scouted it and just rolled. And great kids. You got really, yeah, really authentic, adorable kids. Yeah, really sweet kids. And someday uh, they'll sue you. Someday. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully that that the movie will make millions of dollars and then <laughs> the kids will come after me like Slumdog. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I mean? Wouldn't that be awesome? Yeah, sure. Polly! <laughs> I want my money, Polly! <laughs> That'd be great. Bye, Antoine! <laughs> no, I would love to, like, I would love to have the film do really well, and I'd love to send them, you know, a million dollars. I don't care. You know what I mean? It'd be great. Uh, and the way that you're working now, of course, totally different than when you were working in Hollywood. Everything just runs through you now. It's not a big... Uh, company behind it or anything no the way i like to do it is i like to find people that like me number mm -hmm. one that want to get into the business and that aren't that familiar with the business do you know what i mean because yeah. if you get someone that that wants to give you money for a project and they've done it a hundred times and they're going to pollute your vision you know what I mean? but if you get someone that you know you don't ask them for a lot of money you, you do you know for a low budget and you keep it kind of in realm at the end of the day i get a piece like adopted where it's all my vision, every edit is my edit, every music cue is my music cue, all the shots are my shots. And, and then at the end of the day, you know, once this thing comes out and, and it's out and people say, oh, I saw Adopted, and they're like, holy shit, that was insane. Like, that feeling is like, wow, like, I, you know, they saw all my moments that I created, you know what right. I mean? It's a pretty cool thing. Not saying that I wouldn't like to do bigger stuff if it made sense, you know? Well, we'll go back to when you were doing those uh, studio movies. You said Jury Duty was the one where it, it all kind of hit the wall. Did you know that immediately? I mean, when it was done, I felt it because I didn't get along with the director. You know, mm -hmm. we had a couple, we had some some issues, and it, it wasn't anything personal at all. You know, he's a great guy, a really good guy, very talented guy. But at the end of the day, you know, you just you just don't feel each other. You know what I mean? Right. It's like a feeling that you have when you. When you have a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend, like sometimes you just don't feel it, you know? And if you're not feeling it, then, you know, you gotta get out. And there was a couple of times where, you know, I wanted to fire him, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, and we had talks and, and he never got fired off the film. I'm not saying that he was the reason why the film wasn't successful, but there was a feeling that I, that I had gotten. But even though that film didn't work out for you, you still had this, you know, backlog of films that did work one after another mm -hmm. and it seems like you know I've looked at different people that seemed like they could get over a bad film or two but it didn't seem like that worked out for you it seemed like they decided okay this fad's over yeah it was like Reeboks <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how I mean is there a thing of wait we just did four that worked you know maybe we had a misstep here but at that point, you can't go out and try another one. They just want well, to I did take... Biodome after that. Oh, Biodome came after that. Yeah. I thought Biodome was in the No, middle. it was after that. And how did Biodome do? It did good, but it yeah. didn't do great. And the critics hated it. And it was like, right. but I loved it. But I loved all my movies I did. Yeah. It wasn't like I was like, oh, that's... I mean, not, not everyone. I did a thing called Bogus Witch Project. which was fucking the worst piece of shit <laughs> yeah. ever. But they pay me $75,000 for one day. So that's why I did it. Yeah. Yeah, but I, and, you know. And if somebody called us with that now, we'd all leave together. Right, together. I mean, right? $75,000? <laughs> it's, it just, it always makes me laugh when people go, well, how could he do that piece of shit? But, you know, you're not like, they called me, they had money. Why wouldn't you go do that, you know? Yeah. Um, but you said Biodome, here the, the career's cruising along. And then the next thing you you know you run into a rough patch, and then the next thing you're working with Stevie Baldwin, and you have to be thinking to yourself, what happened? Me and Baldwin. No, I'm only kidding. He was, He's a real good friend of mine. Oh I'm no, just but, with no, but, <laughs> no, he was. It, it was. It was. It was. Uh, he was hot off a of Usual Suspects. Right. So um, 
he chose to work with me from what I hear is what he has told me that he was a fan. Yeah. Like he liked my stuff. I made him giggle and he wanted to do a Pauly Shore film. And, um, and, uh, and that's why he, you know, and that's why he, I guess, wanted to work with me. And I know it was funny. I know his, his brother, Alec, yeah. basically said, if you work with Pauly Shore, your fucking career's over. <laughs> and he was right. <laughs> well, the, the weird thing about Stevie is the last time I saw him, he's still on a skateboard. He's still, he's kind of that guy yeah, more well, than the other. Yeah, he lost his mind. It's yeah. like, man, <laughs> you got Stephen Baldwin is, you know, on a skateboard praising Jesus. <laughs> you know, you got Andy Dick living in a shed and, and Lori Petty's doing alcohol <laughs> fucking treatment centers. No, no I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> every, every it's work, tough. It's a tough business. Yeah. I don't know what to tell you. You know, it's tough. Just put that anywhere. <laughs> no, it's it's a tough, it's a tough business. It's a tough business. It's It's a really hard business. But at the end of the day, if you enjoy it, you got to keep doing it, you know? Right, but I, it's awful to see so many of your co-stars crash and burn. It's terrible. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing to them, man. I don't know. You're, I, you're next. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, we interviewed each other on series. It was great. I was fucking homeless. <laughs> I don't know. He just rubbed off on me, and all of a sudden, he's making more money. <laughs> it's really close to being true. That's the scary part, if you only know. Uh, after that, you t you did take a, a, some time off though, right? In between some of those. Before well, after you came back. Biodome. Yeah. After Biodome. Yeah. Biodome came out. It did all right. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't do great, but it did all right. I loved it, like I said. And then after that, we did the sitcom. Right. We did the sitcom on Fox. I thought I was the next Jerry Seinfeld for sure. You thought it was going oh, to yeah. just blow up. Oh and yeah, because back in those days, if you went from film to sitcom, it's like that's like you know you're almost like doing the network a favor you're like you can have me <laughs> like I'm a, I'm a movie star you can have me take me you know what I mean so so they um, they uh, you know came up with this this concept called Polly, mm. which was my sitcom on Fox that lasted like six or seven episodes and it was just all wrong mm -hmm. you know what I mean the concept was wrong and but I worked with these two sh gay showrunners. Like, no, it's Polly, and <laughs> you're gonna do this. And it's gonna be so cute, and and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, really? You know what I mean? <laughs> it sounds good. And all of a sudden, I'm gay. You know what I mean? <laughs> then I'm canceled. I'm like, what the fuck? It's fucking gays. They got me. <laughs> but um, but you didn't see it going wrong. You just got caught no, up in the because, excitement of it. Because I wasn't thinking. <laughs> again, I wasn't thinking that the premise was wrong for me. Right. You know, I played a spoiled rich kid from Brentwood who, whose dad, you know, mom divorced and his dad died or his dad remarried like a gold digger. Mm -hmm. I mean, the gold digger girl were always after. It was a funny show, but it wasn't right for me. Right. It would have been good for someone else. It was wrong for me. So. Uh, and when that starts to happen, yeah. you're going from movies to the sitcom. And when that starts to happen, the critics start to tee off on you a little bit. Well, they too. were teeing off on me a yeah. while ago, yeah. Did that stuff ever bother you at all? I mean... No, uh, it, 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 it didn't bother me because they kept offering me stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, when they kept dissing me and then they stopped offering me <laughs> stuff, that's when I was fucking really yeah. not good. Um, you, could take, you could take all the shit they had to say as long as they kept giving you more stuff. Yeah, I was working. Well, fuck them. What do you yeah. need to fucking know? I just got a job. I'm working. Yeah. You're just sitting in your little office. <laughs> <laughs> fuck him. He'll see. <laughs> <laughs> so at, at that point, you said that a little bit of depression hit. Though. This when, isn't my what? fucking... You and Howard Stern have been my fucking therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was on Howard Stern about my fucking family and my brothers who hate my fucking guts. <laughs> and then now I'm here with the career. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I gotta go to the Russian spa for this shit. Well, no, it's. <laughs> I, and we the have Schwitz, a volume. The Schwitz. We have a volume if you Give need me a volume it. Volume at, at the door. <laughs> you you know, it's 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 yeah. Maybe it would, maybe you'd feel better if you didn't lay down while we were talking. Maybe yeah, exactly. <laughs> sat up in a power position. <laughs> what went wrong? What went wrong, mm -hmm. Doc? Um, yeah, it, it, you know, it was like the jig was up, you know what yeah. I mean? It was like, it was like, I was, tur I was going from a, uh, from a boy to a man. I was turning 30, 31, 32, around yeah. that time. And it was just like, um, the weasel stuff's done. Like, I'm not young anymore. 
And and that's when, you know, I hit my bottom. Right. You know, my bottom, whatever my bottom was. It's a lot different than most people's bottoms. Mm -hmm. It's a lot different than Andy Dick's bottoms or Corey Haynes' bottoms or, you know, these other people that are, you know, that, that you know what I mean? Yeah. I never got that way. But emotionally, I was sad. I lost my smile. You know, I, lo I believed everything and I became heavy and just depressed. But you didn't have the drug and alcohol problems. No, yeah. it was um, girls maybe. Yeah. You know, I was into girls. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? But it wasn't so much like I'm going to go out on a, you know, six day, you know, Tom Sizemore binge on meth, you know, in some jungle or something like it, it never I never got into that, that kind of. But at a certain point, did you kind of miss being that guy, the guy who, you know, had movies opening and it wasn't so much that I miss it. I would just miss working. You know what right. I mean? It was like almost like if every year you go to school. You know, as a child or whatever. Okay, this is September. I'm going to go to my year. I'm going to go to school. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. You know, you're used to that. They took that away from me. So I was like, shit. You know what I mean? So it's like I, was, I used to love to go to work. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And that's what I missed. I missed doing those films and, and, you know, learning the script and then sending it to me and developing it and the process of making a film once a year. I miss uh that. Uh, and even now, even though miss you it. say you go back, yeah, to I miss it. No, I miss it. I did a, I did a small part in a, um, a Nick Schwartzen film uh, that Adam Sandler produced, cocksucker, son of a bitch. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, that that Adam Sandler produced, and and I showed up on the set, mm -hmm. and there was all the gaffers and and all the, the you know the the the, the cameraman and the cra everyone just gave me so much love. Like everyone was like, "Where have you been? We miss you." You know, we you got to come back to movies. People want to see you, and and God, where have you been? Because all because it's a family out there in Hollywood. Right. Like the guys that shoot the movies and the craft service, and like I remember I worked with you, and you know what I mean. So it was like all this, like it's like my family. It's almost like the circus, mm -hmm. and I miss that. You know what I mean? I miss that kind of family, that that kind of um, those friends that I had. You know. So. That lifestyle that you kind of grew up in, that was, you know... No, it was the lifestyle that I created after MTV, movie yeah. after movie. I missed that kind of, that part of my life. But you even know? when I see you do stuff, I mean, you know, even in terms of the audience, one, one of the things about <coughs> you is like when you do Entourage, mm -hmm. there's a total recognition. I mean, you don't need to set up the premise. You know, when you do something like you, the work you did on Entourage, everyone was in on the joke immediately. I, lo I loved the, the chemistry that I had with... Um, with um, uh, Kevin Dillon. Unbelievable. I yeah. mean, so much fun. Like, he's like, oh, there's fucking Polly. Yeah, like, right. It's great. It's like, yeah. you know what and, I mean? And, and I'm like, hey, bro, what's up? And he's yeah. like, fuck. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, immediately you get it. Yeah. You know, like, the best is seriously, like, like I laugh. Like, when they're, like, talking at a table, talking shit about me. Yeah. Like, what's he doing here? Like, it's funny. <laughs> you know what I mean? What was really funny is, like, it almost seemed like you had been on that show. Right. For a long time. Right. Because you have built up this thing. Right. And, like, that, what you're saying that you'd like to go back and do with movies, it's really hard for that brand to exist for people. Especially, mm. like we were talking mm. about before, there's so many places to go for entertainment. Mm. Yours is already built, and it, you know, maybe is just one movie away. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but at the end of the day, as long as I still feel like doing it, that's all that I really care about. At the end of the day, if I stop feeling it, then I'm fucked. Right. Do you know what I mean? If I stop going, you know, like the stuff that I'm doing right now, I'm like totally fulfilled. Do, would I do a big, big movie? If it made sense, of course I would. But if not, I'd do these other things, but I'm still being fulfilled. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, and in the last couple of movies that you did yourself, you're basically playing the part of Paul. You're not even... Yeah, a version of myself. Yeah, but you're not even giving the character a different name. No. How, how come you went in that direction? I mean... Because, I don't know, I think it was funnier and it's more relatable and mm -hmm. I want people to think, like, did that really happen? <laughs> did he really kill himself? And, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know if you saw Polly Shore is dead. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, but it's a it's a it's a pretty cool film, and I play myself basically faking my death to become famous again. You know what I mean? Because when people don't see you in the business, they immediately think you're dead. So I wanted everyone to think I was dead because I thought that was funny. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like 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 carrot top moves into my house, and <laughs> you know I'm parking cars at the comedy store, and you know I wind up in jail with like you know Tommy Lee, <laughs> you know. But I put all these people in there. But the way I directed it and the way I created this piece. It's very dark and it's very yeah, real. It is. And I created that kind of tone. You know what I mean? So people would be like, well, this isn't real, but it is real. And plus, if you just see it, if you're watching it 
on, on, on HBO or Showtime and all of a sudden it comes on and there's like these testimonials from people like <laughs> Polly died and it's like you're gonna think like shit he died <laughs> you know what I mean so um yeah so so that was that was that was a pleasure that that film I loved it and but do you think you like to keep right it, it kind of reminds me of like Woody Allen would play Woody Allen but still go or Larry like, David yeah Larry right, David right. is doing the same thing uh where you're crossing back over those lines and for yourself you know, growing up in this business, I guess it's not that odd for you. You don't need to separate it as much. I would, I, but the, the thing is, I want to do pieces that are good, number one. That's all, that, well, that's what I care about. And if it means that I'm playing myself in that piece, then, then I'll play myself. But like, for instance, the next thing that I'm doing is an MTV show, mm. right? We sold a pilot to MTV. It's something that I created. Again, I'm playing myself on that, but it's a version of myself. Then the other two things that I'm doing, two scripts that I came up with, I'm not playing myself. So it's, a, so it's, it's project by project. If it makes sense you know, for me to play myself in that particular project, then I want to play myself in that particular project. And do you want to do other characters, or is it a matter of now you're looking at directing and producing? I love directing myself. Yeah. Because it's almost like going to high school and like shaping that... Right. You know what I mean? And you can watch the playback after. Oh, that <laughs> sucked. Let me take that up a little. That was too real. That was the, 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 like the stuff. If you go on Funny or Die, mm -hmm. there's a clip that I did um, when I'm Anderson Cooper's interviewing me mm -hmm. about uh, celebrity adoption. And if you see that piece, I produced it and I shot it in a way where if you watch it, you're like, fuck, he's on Anderson Cooper. <laughs> like he really is on Anderson Cooper. <laughs> you know what I mean? But what I did is I took editorially, we took the interview of him interviewing Angelina about, you know, adoption, and we put me in there. <laughs> but but, but it, it's not goofy. It's not goofy, right? Right. Did you see it? Yeah, I did see yeah, it's, it. Yes, it's, it's real. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's played real, but it's funny, so, you know what I mean? So it's like, you know, it's, that, it's important. The tone is really important. You know, tone is really important to me because I think that's important. Uh, and for you, where you are right now, this is... You kind of got the next couple of years shaped off with these other projects. Feels yeah, good to you. Yeah, I hope this stuff with my family works out because I think my mom's legacy deserves absolutely. You know, deserves me to to you know come up with a plan that that can take you know what she created into this younger generation. You know of, of all that stuff. So that's something I want to work on. And then, um, and, and is Tom Hanks doing some movie on about was, your mom? But I don't know if he's still doing yeah. it anymore. It was about a book, the book, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't know if he's doing. it. I mean, someone's gonna do it. Right. Might as well be me. You know what I mean? I <laughs> yeah. lived it. It's my mom. You know what I mean? It's her legacy, and I and I would kind of know how she would want it to be as well. Yeah. You know. Uh, and you were saying you brought up the stuff about your brothers. That's the type of stuff that you guys are battling about. Yeah, it's kind of like just you know sibling kind of you know everyone's jockering for their position in the estate and all that stuff, and it's kind of just gross. Right. And it's sad, and it's you know I've lost my relationship with my family, you know, with my siblings because of the not my mom and my dad. I'm cool with them, but um, so yeah, it's really sad. Mm. But, you know, time, like everything, I think, will kind of, you know, just like anything, if someone dies in your family or you get a divorce, like, it's fucked right there. But then eventually, you know, it lays out and, 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 and you know, and you learn and you hopefully we can spend Thanksgiving together. They're not going to call me a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Right? You fucking cunt. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right? Yeah, no, my family's not like that. But, um, <laughs> but your family didn't go to the comedy store. No, we didn't. No. Yeah, so. Oh, we were at the improv. Right. Um, <laughs> hey. You were on Melrose. Yeah. This has been a great therapy session yeah, for yeah, you today, yeah. but I also promised the audience that okay, they could cool, ask uh, some questions. Some questions for uh, Polly Shore. Oh, hi, Paulie. How do you know he even wanted to ask me a question? <laughs> I was signaling him. Uh, and in Encino Man, you said they b changed one of the parts for you, but I was wondering, did you write that part? Did you improv, or did the, yeah, no, were the we writer's verse? For me, for, for, I rewrote it for me and the writers. We rewrote it for the character that I was, or the, the, the persona that I had on MTV. Were you always kind of free to do that with whatever you're doing? No, they made me do it. Yeah. Because then if you had like some stodgy, you know, you know, executive writer, blah, 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 trying to do, hey, 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 ah, ah, ah. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, it'd be like, that's not right. <laughs> <laughs> that one didn't work at all. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Paulie. 
uh, wanted to find out, how big of a decision was it for you to cut your hair in, uh, in the Army? It wasn't a decision. I couldn't wait to cut my hair. You know what I mean? I couldn't wait to cut my hair because my, I was so known for, like, my hair. You know what I mean? I was like Kenny G. <laughs> <laughs> and, but I wanted, to do, I wanted to do it in a film where it actually calls for that to do it. Which, you know, it would be stupid to do a film and have the Kenny G hair the whole time. <laughs> right. You know, got to cut your hair in basic training. So, yeah, I cut my hair. But it is interesting that people still asked you. Yeah, about they, it they all still the, remember my hair. As yeah, if it's a big everybody deal. didn't have a lot of hair in high school. It's uh... no, it's 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 you know it's it's what you know it's what I was known for. It's like that image, that I mean that's how strong you know movies and TV and and the shit is is that people have these images of people. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like I think David Spade said it. He goes. So many people in the business work so hard to come up with their own thing, and they work so hard to get away from their own thing. Sure. So it's 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 interesting. I mean, Madonna and like Bono to me have done it like <clears throat> beautifully. Like somehow they keep reinventing themselves, right? And keep being cool every three to five years for some reason. You know what I mean? And maybe you know able to move along and not look Be like stuck. They were because 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 yeah. we all know Madonna and and Bono and and that, that time frame was like eighties, but for some reason yeah. they keep. You know what I mean? And yet they'll they'll uh, put David Lee Roth back there, but they won't with Bono, and they were they were right. at the same exact time. Right. And everyone's like, oh Bono, he just okay. He's the same as David Lee Roth. <laughs> There's no difference. Why why be hard on David Lee Roth? Yeah. Because he's a Jew. Ah! Oh, finally, it all comes out. This is what, the, this is what therapy is for. This is why we're working this, Paulie. You've got it now. You're going to be able to sleep tonight. Trust me. Yes. What's up, Paul? Yeah, I was just curious, like, with the whole thing with Wes Craven and living next to him, especially after the lawsuit, how, like, how's that going? If there's any like, issues with that? Well, Wes Craven is just a bizarre guy anyways. <laughs> it really has nothing to do with me. He's a bizarre guy, but if you look at his films, like, why wouldn't he be bizarre? You know, he's, he's, he, you know, he's, there's, there's a lot of, you know, people in the business, you know, Quentin Tarantino, like, people are bizarre. You know what I mean? He's just a bizarre guy. He's a genius, but he's, he's a little, you know, so, you know, it's like oil and water. Like, we didn't mix, you know what I mean? But... It's not that he doesn't like me and I don't like him. We have a cool relationship, but it's not like we're going out for tea and crumpets. Mm. So when my hillside went down, you know, it was like that was like a reason for him to kind of like, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it wasn't like my fault. It was like just the hillside just went down. <laughs> but, and then I guess that may, since he's bringing up, that made the news that you guys had this, this neighborly dispute. Yeah. 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 Uh, but is, it is kind of weird to be living next door to Wes Craven. I mean, it's not... Nightmare on Polly Street. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I had a joke in my act. I said, oh, I, you know, I don't even fucking remember the joke, but it was something about that. Uh, we'll try to find it uh, on an old CD. Yeah. Yeah, over here. Hi. Hi, Polly. Um, did MTV ever tell you that it was too much or that you went too far at any point? No. No, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> no because at the time... <laughs> At the time, I spoke my own language. Yo, how buff is my wood? Check out the wood you created. Ah, ah. And they would be like, and they're like, well, he didn't say dick. He didn't say pussy. So it was like almost like it was like a, a Morris code to the stoners. Right? Yeah. And the censors didn't know. Like when you say, how buff is my wood? I'm basically saying, how hard is my dick? You know what I mean? But they didn't, they didn't know. So it was, you know, and, I, and at the time, I was so, like, just spewing shit out, people didn't understand. Me, so. And you would have been doing that even before you got the camera? There was just something yeah, you were doing yeah, in your yeah, neighborhood? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's the strangest thing. <laughs> <laughs> it is just, America is the craziest country ever. Yeah. Hey, Blonde, what's going on? Uh, after growing up in Hollywood, there any uh, celebrities you met when you were a little kid that were... Me to you or kind of scary. Douches? Yeah, <laughs> assholes, you know. Yeah. Um, I don't remember. That time was a blur to me. Um, we can hypnotize you. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> um, yeah, I would have to say I don't know. I had problems with kids in school. As far as celebrities, I mean, I did go to Beverly Hills High School. There were celebrities there, but I had I had problems with this kid. Um, his name was Chad Nellis. 
and he had like a twin brother and they kind of look like the he looks like the guy that just like murdered the girls <laughs> what's his name Jorn Vanden Sloot <laughs> like imagine two of those brothers like real fucking dicks you know what I mean right and like right yeah like, just like you know I remember one time like like I was at the beach and it was like 4th of July and it was at night and he like literally tapped me on the co- shoulder and I turned around and he cold cocked me. He punched me right in the face and I went down. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And uh, I think that's where they came up with the scene in Son-in-Law where they like, punched <laughs> me. No, um, but he cold cocked me and like, you know, and I just got up and, you know, everyone chased him on the beach and he was gone. And, um, but he was just a dick. You know what I mean? He was just one of those guys. But I remember doing my HBO special and I remember, you know, uh, 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 talking about him and then looking in the camera and saying, fuck you to him. <laughs> and that was pretty cool. And everyone went, whoa! You know what I mean? That was cool. That's the final payback. Uh, Paulie, it's great to see you. Congratulations cool. on the new movie. Adopt it. Make sure you see it, everybody. Put your hands together for Paulie Shore. Paulie. 